I've had quite a few requests over the years of the channel to talk about my favorite solo RPG resources. And this video will cover, I'm going to say some of them, um, because maybe there's going to be another video that will emerge as well. I don't want to make this too long, so I'm really just doing the highlights. And also, I have talked about some of these resources in other videos, and I don't want to be too repetitive. So you could go to my channel as well and look at some of the general RPG resource videos that I've already done for some further explanation of, of things. But what I'm going to start with here is just the basic resource, which is a very uh, common one, which is just a notebook, obviously. I have a series of these notebooks, and sometimes I keep them when I'm done with them, sometimes I don't. And this is where I will jot down ideas. It is where I will um, have in the back here, I have ideas for future videos that I might do charts and graphs and things like that to create my tables. And I think the continuity of it, uh, just this morning I was playing a little Warhammer Quest RPG scenario with one of my kids and we needed to find what the weather was going to be and I remember that I had made a weather table and it was somewhere in here. So I think the continuity of game to game is important to me, less so in a campaign way than in the uh, concepts and things that I might put into a story. Because if you watch my channel, you know I'm sort of more partial to individual adventures or what might be called one-offs than an ongoing campaign for a variety of reasons. That's more my play style. But back to the point of this video. I'm going to start with a couple of books that are um, directly or indirectly related to RPG, and they're really war game oriented um, as a history of this genre of play. Um, I think Playing at the World uh, by John Peterson is excellent. There you can see the whole thing. It's an excellent, uh, comprehensive, massive history of war gaming and how it led to the development of D&D and other RPGs. Why is this useful? Well, for, for me, in understanding how narrative emerges from this type of gameplay. It provides a useful foundation and it gives me a lot of ideas. Most of what I'm doing when I'm doing solo RPGing is just a different way of creating stories and narratives. That's what draws me to this style of play and that's what I'm always looking to be able to do in an inventive way. And understanding the history of how these systems originally developed is um, useful to me. And again, obviously this is a video from my perspective. These are my favorite tools. They may or may not be of use or relevance, <clears throat> excuse me, to you, clearly. Along those lines, it has been important to me to understand the history of wargaming and what it means to simulate war in a, in a game state on a tabletop. And I find this book very excellent in going through that history. As you can see, I spilled some coffee on it. Good reading um, in the morning. And it does go through uh, the history and theory of modeling war and different ways of modeling conflict dynamics. And it gives examples uh, from ancient warfare and tactical combat and of course, World War II. Again, this is very much in line with understanding how war games work, which you may think to yourself doesn't have anything to do with solo RPGing, particularly if you're not playing an entire warband. But for me, understanding the notion of conflict and how encounters are modeled in game systems, this background information I bring to the table when I am setting up to do my own adventure. Likewise, uh, Peter Perla's Art of Wargaming is another excellent resource for understanding uh, the details of strategic wargaming and the way in which these games were created, the way in which the rules were written and tested. And for me, that type of background is quite useful. More particularly and specifically into doing this solo, we have two solo wargaming guides that are the basis. You've seen me use at least this one in one of my videos as the basis for creating, I think it was actually the weather. Uh, table now that I think about it. Uh, these are resources that are more specific to solo play and have given me ideas over the years for ways of creating a randomization table, ways of building a basic 
kind of enemy AI and ways of thinking about encounters. And I think all of these books, these four books together, have helped me to envision encounters as more than just um, here I am, here's an enemy, and let's have a conflict. It has allowed me to use the encounters as another moment for narrative creation and some understanding some of the military tactics and design tactics that go into war games helps me to do that in my own storytelling. And finally, here a couple of resources that are more generally speaking about game design. This book, Second Person, is an edited collection. It's um, about role playing and story in games and playable media. So it is not simply just tabletop at all. In fact, a lot of it is about, uh, well, here is um, Call of Cthulhu, but it has tabletop systems, what they're calling computational fi uh, fictions, interactive fiction, and um, even other things like online game worlds and uh, the real world. But the and again, it's an edited collection, so it's, some of it is inconsistent in terms of the topic and even the quality. But overall, understanding what goes into the thought process of, as we look at the credits here, of designing narrative-based games. I'll just give you a brief, you can pause it and look at this part of the table of contents if you want. Understanding what goes into the uh, ways in which narrative is put into games, whether it is a tabletop system or a computer system, for me, I find, I have found helpful over the years in thinking about how can I put narrative into my own games. And finally, along the lines of game design, there are two books, they're also, all these are from MIT Press actually, uh, Rules of Play is about game design fundamentals, and again, this is not going to be just tabletop, it's going to be all different types of games, and in fact, there's a fairly heavy emphasis on computer games in this uh, book. This is a more theoretical discussion of games and what rules mean and what it means to play and how to design and how to make something interactive. And the other book, the companion book, is The Game Design Reader, which is another anthology that gets into more specifics about um, game design and narrative and economies and models and things like that. Video games are covered, it's not just tabletop, and if you are, you know, again, I'm not going to, this isn't a book review, this is just a, a review of resources, so you can go check this out on your own to see if you think it will be useful, but for example, game design as narrative architecture, interaction and narrative, adventure as a video game, this to me has been useful over the years in conceptualizing my story that I'm telling through the mechanics of a rule set, whatever rule set that might be. It is a game-based rule set if I'm trying to do some type of RPG. And speaking of narrative, you have also seen me, if you've watched any of my videos, you've seen me turn to novels, specifically gothic novels, and I'm just going to show you a couple of them here, to have some type of random environment or even a random encounter or a suggestion of an encounter come into play in my game. And quite simply put, um, this is a matter of knowing the genre or having books in the genre as I do. My academic background is in Victorian literature and so I've got thousands of <laughs> thousands of books uh, from which to choose and a long history of study and reading in these books, but you don't need that in order to make use of novels in this way. And you can, again, various videos of mine show how I do this, but it's simply rolling on a random page and starting to read the narrative and from that taking the suggestion of the environment or even the feeling or the um, possible encounter that is happening. And you need to choose your books wisely, of course, because you need to choose books that will fit whatever theme you're doing. The examples here are what I would consider to be atmospheric and kind of gothic novels with a lot of highly wrought emotional passages that can very easily be integrated into a story. They aren't game related and um, as such I find them expansive in terms of thinking about where I might be going with it. So I could be showing you thousands but I just chose three um, that I have used fairly recently and even on the channel. 
Another book of mine uh, that you've seen, I believe, on the channel is this Dictionary of Symbols. This is a massive tome and it is alphabetically organized and it has entries that will discuss, for example, this is just random, bronze, the symbolic value of bronze. And it goes through this um, throughout world as well as world history. So you're getting a cross-cultural and cross-historical explanation of whatever it might be. You could choose to use something like this in, in any way that you wanted. You could have, for example, I've talked about the value of starting a character with a random trinket. The, I think that is the single best piece of advice I could give to anyone doing solo RPGing. Give your character something random, something minor, but something very tangible. And whatever that might be, whatever trinket table you're rolling on, perhaps, and this was the case in, a, in one of my videos that I did on the channel, and certainly has been the case elsewhere, um, you could find that in here, whatever icon it is, whatever um, piece of jewelry or whatever, and the description in here is going to be very rich and as I said, it's going to be historical. It's going to be um, across many different time periods. There may be something in that that you can latch onto. So here, just another random thing. Um, we've got a feather here and the, sim the symbolism of what feathers are. And there's even a story about a feather. Something like this can really be generative for you in terms of beginning a story, of getting a character going. I've talked about in other videos the challenge of Character creation itself is never a challenge because that is the part of the RPG rule set that's basically the same whether you're playing with a group or solo because it's walking you through everybody at the beginning of a tabletop session if they haven't played before is going to be creating their character. So the rules work for that and as soloists we can kind of get sucked into that but then you've got your character and then what? That's when you need the GM or the DM giving your character something to have in their bag, in their hand, and then walking you through a step of what that could mean, that could be a very excellent way of starting a story. And of course, it's, um, it would be game neutral. You could do this for any type of rule set that you had. Another way is simply, I mean, this is a massive book. It's, you know, 1,200 pages or whatever. You could get a random number generator and just generate a random number open to that page and find whatever entry it is and say that that is what your character is carrying or that is the symbol or the icon that a party has encountered. So I find this to be exceptionally rich um, and useful in a many, a many different types of ways during a session. And lastly, when it comes to books, I have shown all of these in videos before, so I won't spend a ton of time on them. Some specific books that are helpful in terms of doing uh, RPGing. These are necessar not necessarily designed for soloists, but for um, a GM, but they're certainly appropriate. The Tome of Adventure Design, you've seen me use this multiple times, is an excellent resource of, I guess they're mostly or all D100 tables that you can roll on and you can adapt these to any system really. They also have um, elements of overall adventure design and uh, they have wilderness here, magic, you name it. This is, as I've talked about at length elsewhere, I think probably the most comprehensive and single best resource for generating random tables, events, and things like that. It is um, a source book uh, uh, for Swords and Wizardry and Pathfinder, but you can, you can use it uh, with anything. So if you're only going to get one, I would recommend that one. That said, the Classic Dungeon Design Guide also offers a lot of tables, and I like the way this is set up. I also talked about this elsewhere because it will, um, it gives you some atmosphere. It gives you a little bit of wilderness travel. It's not as comprehensive as the tome, but it does offer some different things more specifically. Uh, for example, I like this, like within the dungeon, um, intermittent sounds or the, the atmospheric conditions of the dungeon. So I find myself using this. Um, it's very specific. So between, you know, the connections between rooms, for example, uh, is it a diagonal card or for more, I think, micro work, even though it also has the wilderness aspect, I enjoy this. I think these two together uh, complement each other quite nicely. And the last, uh, point I'll mention here is I find myself turning to, I've got the 3.5 um, 
DM's guide, and I find myself turning to this quite a bit for various things, trinket tables and um, all sorts of things really that uh, can come into play if you need to get some sense of a difficulty level or a modification. Again, you could be modifying this to whatever system you are working with, but it will give you a suggestion of things, and um, I find it to be I find it to be of use in coming back to it. I'm usually using certain aspects of it more than others, but this is definitely also probably my number three RPG-based, what I consider to be general resource for my own play. Of course, as a soloist, you're going to need some kind of uh, yes-no types of tables or oracles or whatever. I don't use a whole ton of them. I have some that are my favorites. This is just a very generic percentile one. I don't even remember anymore where it came from. I've had it for years and um, I, I just find myself using it. Some of these other ones, this is from, I believe, Scarlet Heroes, which I'm going to be doing a separate video on at some point. And it is a little more complicated, for example, than this one, if you want to go in that direction. Uh, this is useful for me in terms of creating encounters and populating the environment with interesting things that may come into play. So rather, again, than just having a monster show up in a dungeon room, not only how far away is it, but then I would say go to the Tome of Adventure Design or some other resource to say, let's describe what's in this room. How is, is it likely, you know, you could go back and say, well, how likely is it that if I'm a big giant, you know, am I hiding behind something? Well, it's probably very unlikely. And set up the encounter that way. So the interplay um, among these resources is really what's going to get you get you moving here. And uh, this is, you know, I can't remember where this is from, but again, another way of rolling on a table to get an answer to a question. And um, this is just an arbitrary. This comes from uh, the master book, I think. This is a little less useful because it's more keyed to a system, but I like the idea of just thinking about what category of difficulty something might be. So this is just a different way of thinking about that than, for example, thinking about it like this. And sometimes depending on the, the system I'm running or the story I'm running, this makes more sense than something like this or something like this. So there are semantic differences, but they can become thematic when you are playing in a certain type of environment. And for that reason, that's why I have a bunch of these. But this, this is really mostly what I use. I don't get, I don't tend to get much more complicated than this for these types of supports. The last thing I'll talk about is my use of maps as resources. And we're looking here at the outdoor survival map. This is, um, I've, I've used this in a video before and talked about the fact that with the original D&D &D came the suggestion that having this map uh, was a requirement for playing D&D. &D. And it is a relatively generic wilderness map with obviously various types of terrain on it, etc. Um, I'm scrolling through here slowly to give you the names rather than just taking everything out of the game closet and showing it to you. I've shown you some of this in my uh, resources, RPG resources video that is um, Easy Ways to Be a Solo GM and the link to that is down below and it's also right now I think the trailer on my channel. Uh, I showed you some of these maps but the point being that using a map if it is relatively generic can be very helpful as a suggestive tool just in terms of knowing where you're walking and I can I have demonstrated in other videos ways to figure out where you're going and also just visually to help you envision something so rather than just playing on a blank surface short of having extensive terrain in your collection using maps that you may have from games that you have or maps that you may obtain from games that could work in this way what the list that I'm showing you is just based on my own collection, and obviously there's a million things out there. You can even look anew at games that you might want to purchase or used games, old games, incomplete games. If they have a map, um, that could be a great resource for you to literally situate, if you're not using minis even, just to be looking at this as you're working in your notebook, as you're creating your story, can be helpful. 
in terms of providing um, just a visual aid, and that can be helpful as opposed to simply um, having having notes about it because that can become, sometimes that can be enough and sometimes that can feel a little bit static. So um, you can be creating a story. This was an old story from a different video I did. Um, you can be creating this story and writing it down, but also having some visual reference. And that can be, that can be helpful for the soloist. So overall, these are some uh, top resources that I use, and I would love to hear your thoughts and comments about things that I might not know about, things that you find useful, and whether there's anything, uh, a category of tools and resources that maybe I didn't even cover at all. Thanks for watching.